I'm going to talk about Ori Cloud and the architecture behind Ori Cloud. And I want to start by looking at our goals we set ourselves in the beginning, right? Because I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, the principle of beginning with the end in mind, uh, because it helps really to make better also short and midterm decisions so that you can really make sure that you end up where you want to end up. And I think quite understandable for us, um, it was from the get-go very important for us that all the decisions we make on the architecture side and software side, we design them with security in mind. As we are handling um, identities, we are granting access with our solution. So this is very central uh, in all our in all the architecture uh, architecture sessions we are doing, and maybe also with the experience we had uh, with the streaming platform. One very important aspect here is um, that Ori Cloud as we see it maybe in a few months, few years, is really a global solution, right? And global means you should really be able to use it everywhere around the world without compromising, for example, on response times, because Ori as a solution will be very central to uh, all requests made to our customer solution. So therefore, we want to ensure that uh, we deliver our responses as fast as possible so that uh, there's a good experience for uh, all the customers using us. And uh, this also goes further. So in order to achieve this, we will build a distributed net and I will show later how we do this or we started to architect into this direction of our services around the world to move them closer to where the customers are. And uh, so on the one hand side, it's about latency, but on the other side, it's also about resilience. So we want to make sure that our system is highly available and resilient to any problems maybe occurring in one service or in one data center location. So that other data center location, for example, can take over, um, yeah, so that there is no uh, problems for our customers on, on this side. And lastly, globally also means uh, in terms of where data is located. So we understand on the one hand side, we want to make uh, data or ourselves available worldwide, but due to uh, data privacy law and also just requirement from our customers, we know that we also need to embed um, fine grade functionality for our customers over time to really decide where data can be located uh, or replicated to. And this is for sure also something where we look forward to discussions with you. So what your concrete requirements are in the different areas. Um, next step would be if we now done, so I was talking about a globally distributed system, right? And this only can work if we really invest in, in making all the processes in operating Ori Cloud highly automated, which is, I think at Ori, also when I started working at Ori, a lot of things are really highly automated because there were only two lead uh, developers with Patrick and Anias all basically working on all these projects. And this was only possible because it was highly efficient and highly automated. And we want to just continue, let's say this Ori tradition and it all will also help us in terms of security, for example, because we need to make sure that if there's a vulnerability uh, exposed and uh, published so that we uh, can very quickly deliver a fix to all our different data center locations. And lastly, but uh, for sure, a very important topic to us. So as we said, we are very proud about our uh, open source ecosystem, about how, how many people use our open source projects. And we really want to make sure that there is a synergy between our Ori Cloud and the open source projects. And uh, this is mainly uh, goes both ways, right? So on the one hand side, we really want to ensure that new features released in any of the open source projects, which is part of Ori Cloud, um, can be used by the customers as quickly as possible. And in the, at the same time, as we use the open source components in Ori Cloud, um, we want to make sure that all the things we do to improve, let's say, Ori Cloud, the operational side of Ori Cloud, um, are also directly being contributed into the open source. And 
I think lately you have seen that we, we did um, improvements, a lot of improvements to the helm shafts as an example. And this is just one area where you see a direct impact. And I think this will only grow in the future. So now, as these are the high level goals, um, let's see how we started and actually how we now today also operate Ori Cloud. So the first thing, the first question we had, okay, how do we actually deploy? Because, and, and where do we deploy to, right? And um, because we, we also made a few iterations to look at what matches best our way of thinking, our way of working. And the first step was pretty easy for us. So um, we early on decided to use Kubernetes. Kubernetes as the foundation of Ori Cloud. Uh, on the one hand side, we have a lot of knowledge, Kubernetes knowledge in the company. On the other side, um, and we are big fans of Kubernetes, uh, of the way how Kubernetes has a declared state and is reconciling the system always to this declared state. And um, on the other side, we saw also an ever uh, increasing interest in the community to run Ori open source on Kubernetes, right? So this was uh, the first aspect. And then once we had this, and this was very quick, uh, it was the other question, so how do we actually deploy? In the beginning, we had simple pipelines deploying directly into Kubernetes when tests were uh, successful, but somehow we felt there needs to be a better way. And also as we knew early on, with security as a focus, we also need to have good, let's say, transparency. What is happening? Who is changing the system? And also have workflows, approval workflows around that. We um, quickly settled on looking into GitOps. And I will explain on the next slide a little bit more in detail what this means for people who, who have maybe heard the term but doesn't really don't really know what is behind that. Um, but so we looked at GitOps and different GitOps solutions, and in the end, we settled on using Argo CD, as this is uh, a very popular, let's say, uh, GitOps solution uh, for Kubernetes, and uh, it was let, the most mature one we found in this area. And to give you the quick introduction into GitOps, um, it's basically very simple. So the first principle of GitOps is that you declare the state of your system. And as we are using Kubernetes, this is mostly uh, YAML files, which basically explain or define all the different aspects of our OE cloud systems, right? And the next part, it's already in the name. These declared a description of the system um, is checked in into Git. And this gives you all the advantages of Git. So we have a commit log. We can have pull request workflows. Um, we can also easily roll back. And it's very transparent um, of who did what at what stage. And we can nicely integrate it as all our other uh, request workflows um, into this uh, setup. And the last component is the controller. So in our case, it's Argo. So this system, Argo in this case, is just connected to Git can read out or is notified on any changes and is then applying changes to Kubernetes. So to ensure that Kubernetes, the, the components deployed in Kubernetes converged to the desired state described in Git. And if we take a look at a small example, um, one of the components we are deploying into the Ori cloud is Keto. And here you will also see a connection to open source, right? On the left hand side, you see uh, right now uh, a YAML file. This is a YAML file defined, uh, which defines how we deploy, with which configuration we deploy Keto to Ori Cloud. And uh, this is a construct in Kubernetes, which is called uh, custom resource definition, which is introduced by Argo. And this is basically really the description of how we deploy uh, using the Helm chart, the open source Helm chart, as you can see in the repo URL, this is pointing to our open source Helm chart repository uh, with a given target version and also with uh, the uh, naming the chart we are using. And the values are just the configuration values. For sure, there's more configuration to it, but this is just to demonstrate the principle. And so basically, if this document is checked into Git, then we have Argo CD, which will read it. It will apply it to a cluster and then also give us uh, a full view in the UI of all the different components which make up 
um, which make up uh, the keto release. And if there would be divergence to the desired state, it would also be visible here. But this is not enough. So Ori cloud is more than um, keto, and therefore um, there's more components. So to bootstrap the uh, architecture, and then we found a project which is called um, Crossplane, and this is from the Crossplane side, like uh, provisioning and manage uh, cloud infrastructure and services using kubectl. The important part is not the kubectl, but in order for kubectl to work, we have manifests, right? And there you can see. So we have again YAML's manifest where we can describe infrastructure components and then they are applied to the cluster. So we can use exactly the same pattern which we liked already uh, a lot when deploying our services. And let's start with a very simple example. Um, this is basically again a YAML fragment, a YAML fragment describing uh, how we would deploy a GKE cluster as we are using um, Google Cloud Platform form and uh, a few elements I just highlighted, right? You can configure all the aspects. So it's a lot of aspects we would be able to configure, but here's only highlighted which version of Kubernetes to use, which uh, what is the location of the cluster, etc. And the principle is basically the same, only that we pair Argo and Crossplane. Argo will read the information, reconcile it with the state in the cluster, and then Crossplane will pick up. Once it sees there's a, a custom resource for a GKE cluster, it will talk to the GCP APIs and create different clusters. So this screenshot is taken uh, from the Google uh, Cloud Platform console uh, of an environment where we tested with different clusters in different regions of the world. And if we take this, now, as a starting point, um, again, the so one thing before we had a cluster which was just there to, to run all the services we need to serve uh, Ori Cloud. Here, we introduced a small cluster which is just there to control all the infrastructure components, right? So we call it MCP, Master Control Plane Cluster. Argo and Crossplane are in this cluster. We connect it and point it to a directory in a private rep uh, repository which is describing a given environment uh, with clusters, uh, but also other aspects of the infrastructure. And then basically once Argo read and um, synchronized uh, all the information in the Git repository to this MCP cluster, Crossplane is picking up, creating different, in this case, GCP resources like buckets and firewall rules, et cetera, and then start basically to create uh, the described clusters. And once this happened, we use Argo CD to basically bootstrap these clusters. And as I said before, when I explained how we deploy the services, right? We have, an, we have a box, so we bootstrap uh, Argo CD in these clusters so that it can start to deploy all these services. And from that moment on, they are completely independent. So uh, we don't need the MCP cluster to serve any customer request. It's only there to ensure that the infrastructure is set up in the way as we want it. And once basically Argo CD is set up in each of these clusters independently, each Argo CD is reconciling the state and building up the different components. And if you still remember, these different colored boxes are represent a certain domain of uh, services with blue, for example, are the ORI services, right? So this would be basically how we set up, uh, set this up so how we can bootstrap in a very easy and automated fashion, different environments, and can also apply change to these environments over time. Um, but this gives us now a situation where we are have a number of clusters and the cloud symbol may be symbol, symbolizing customers who want to access the system. Right now, so how do we do the ingress? And for us, it was very also important that we Although we picked GCP as it's offering the best Kubernetes, managed Kubernetes experience, we want to be able to have the ability to use different cloud providers on deploy to different uh, other infrastructures. And so also the ingress component or ingress layer, we wanted to see uh, if we find a good solution to keep it independent from the cloud provider. And uh, so we picked Cloudflare and Cloudflare is basically doing different aspects. So we started to use Cloudflare uh, for DNS management. And when we switched or 
um, improved our architecture so that we have multi-cluster support, multi-region support. We needed a load balancing uh, aspect to it. And so this is also where we use Cloudflare to basically route to all the different uh, clusters available. And in case there's a, a problem with a cluster, it will reroute the traffic to the next closest um, cluster available as it uses a dynamic routing policy right now. So with all the health checks Cloudflare is doing to determine if the cluster is healthy, it also um, measures the latency and therefore it builds up a latency map and is forwarding traffic to the next and fastest cluster around. Um, then also with this change, we, we pushed TLS before we were using Let's Encrypt and Cert Manager. Now we are pushing this to Cloudflare and to the Cloudflare Edge and taking it from there we have also um, one of the most important features or a very important feature in Kratos we, we are going to offer is custom host names so that you can expose the Kratos APIs or can access the Kratos APIs under your own domain or subdomain like osmydomain.com. And this is also backed by functionality for proof of ownership of this domain um, in Cloudflare. And then I think Cloudflare is quite famous for doing very good DDoS protection and also rate limiting. So this is something how we building out a more uh, really ensuring that our platform is secured uh, for these kind of acts. And um, lastly, CDN to improve user experience, but also making the system again more resilient. So having said that, um, if we then, um, ah, right now, this is maybe a very important aspect. Um, currently, we still use, uh, for the setup, automatic setup of Cloudflare using Pulumi. Um, Pulumi is just taking, we are um, taking the metadata we get from Crossplane on the available clusters, and then it uses this to configure Cloudflare via uh, API. So this is an automatic or automated process. But in the future, we really want to consolidate and we want to control contribute um, in cross-plane there is a Cloudflare provider, but it's not supporting all the resources we, we are using. So we want to contribute to that to really ensure that we streamline our setup and really have only for all infrastructure or environment setup topics, we have only cross-plane available. So to wrap up quickly, um, there's a lot of learnings. I just picked a few. So um, automation, so as you saw, there's a, we have a, highly automated setup to, to spin up from, from simple, <laughs> some declarations in Git, spin up uh, an environment with a lot of many different clusters around the world. And automation can be a double-edged sword, uh, sword as we had also an incident where we were not aware about some hidden magic and suddenly for a short moment, uh, the GitOps controller were looking at an empty Git branch and uh, it was starting basically to clean out the environment because the desired state for this short second was there is no clusters. Um, and it started to do uh, roll out uh, the cleanup process. And so um, we, I think the good thing is we learned a lot out of this incident. We already fixed uh, almost all the action items in there. And, but this is also for us uh, just another reminder to have invest heavily in testing. Also, testing for our own services is very good, um, but also add a chaos engineering component to that. And this is maybe also see if someone in the community has a good solution. So somehow we would like to have a better way to validate new versions of third-party solutions we are deploying. An example would be Q Prometheus stack as a very large component. Um, and the validation, so what can we do upfront to really determine that everything is working? Would be interesting to see if the community has also a good solution to that. And for the next step, as I already mentioned, so it's always about all the learnings. Also then again, to see that we can streamline our setup. An example was cross-plane, so to get rid of uh, Pulumi in this case. Um, we integrate chaos measures in uh, open source projects to do chaos engineering in Kubernetes, but also can introduce uh, failure to GCP, to the GCP resources. So the first test looks very good and promising, and this will help us to make the platform more resilient. Um, then globalize environments with uh, what Anias also explained in the keynote yes, uh, yesterday. Um, so we want to open it up also for developers um, 
to have a free tier. And so we, we want to see that we can serve maybe not full scope global in the beginning, but have a uh, US and those important regions basically covered there. Um, and software, so security is a big topic and especially also uh, the software supply chain security. And we start by um, providing, we will provide SBOMs, so software bill of material for our open source components, but also for Ori Cloud itself. 